Hey everybody, welcome to Nightliner Tattoo. Um, I unfortunately have done what I like to half jokingly refer to as a big stew special. Um, I've, I've managed to lose the footage of the lining of this tattoo. So this was me doing the stencil for the tattoo. Um, Phil had a lot of scars all over his chest, sort of acne scars for being young. So there was a there was a lot of scar in here, and then obviously there was a cover up on the right hand side, um, which I didn't do the cover up. But this is the only footage I could find of the line work that we done. Um, I don't know, maybe a month ago, something like that. Um, before my wife got ill anyway, so it must have been actually it must have been a long time ago. It must have been at least three or four months ago. But that's the only footage I could find, so, um, yeah, please forgive my stupidity, but this is me setting up, um, everybody's got their own ways of doing things, I'm very much an old school tattooer, so everything's got to be done, but it's be done like cling film, and, you know, people tend to, like to use, like, bed, sofa bed covers and all that sort of stuff, that's just not my thing, I like to do old school cling film, but, um, tell me what you think of this footage, particularly, this is my new camera, um, and then in a second I'll go back to the GoPro, so that's the GoPro now. Um, yeah, i got a new camera and hopefully it's working out alright, but we'll see. Anyway, this is Phil, or Philip, I never asked him if he prepares Phil or Philip, but this is Phil. Um, really enjoyed doing this piece, I mean I really did, this is one of my torso pieces, um, obviously, as you can see because it's on his front, but uh, he sat super well. Um, and any of you that, that have your, your torso tattooed know that um, at some point during it, you're going to hit every part, sternum, collarbone, chest, stomach, ribs. Uh, it's just awful. But uh, he done so, so, so well. This was really, really fun. I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed the the dramaticness of this, you know, the, the way it changes instantly. And it was really fun st starting with the colour. Just really popped. It was super, super fun. So, um, yeah, I hope you like this. I really, really enjoyed doing this one. If you want a torso design from me, I've got heaps of them up on my page. So give me a shout. But, yeah, this was super fun. And, again, um, I don't know if I mentioned, actually, I primarily use Dermaglow Tattoo Ink, which is the red and the yellow and the green that I used in this. And the black's just dynamic black, but they're my favourite colours. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed and as watching it as much as I enjoyed doing it. So thank you very much. And what's coming up now is uh, the finished product. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. As I say, covering up a lot of scars, but super, super fun. So thank you very much, Phil. I really appreciate it, buddy. Alexa, pause the music. Hey, everybody. So um, this is a part of... Uh, there's going to be a few updates on Sarah. Um so I'll get to emotional stuff in another video um, for her and for me, for, for both of us. But for now, this is a part, a couple parts actually that she's now comfortable with me telling you. Not because there's any embarrassment, but because she's just now comfortable with me telling you. Um, remember one of the videos ago, I explained that there was a long list of complaints and um, some of them, you know, there was no point in bringing them up and some of them were quite bad and there was two that were really bad but there was one that was really 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 bad i can tell you about this now because of the next thing that i'm about to tell you so for those of you those of you probably uh are most some of you might be aware but when things like bills rupture and burst and stuff like that 99 percent, if not 100 of people need to get a temporary stoma which for those of you that don't know just google it um but it's effectively they move your hold on they move your bum to to here effectively so they they cut a hole in you and I won't show you any but I'll show you a diagram of uh, what they are it's, it's fairly simple but I'll show you now So yeah, that's what they do. They effectively pull out some of your intestines with a little bit of your side of you, and that's where you poo. You got a little bag, and it's temporary. Um, sometimes it's permanent, um, but in Sarah's case, it's temporary, um, which I'll get onto in a minute. But um, one of the things that happened in in the hospital was Sarah. She couldn't walk. Obviously, she couldn't. She couldn't go to the bathroom for a wee. She had a catheter for peeing, so she didn't have to go to the bathroom, and she had. Uh, 
So when, when all that stuff happens, you, you no longer poo from your bum. Um, now, it turns out that this is a lot more common in the world than even I thought it was. But um, yeah, that's, a lot of people have stomas. Um, so you get a bag on and I'll show you the bags here. And they just attach on and then you, you take them off, you clean and you put them in. It's just, you know, it's just life. It's just what it is. It's, it's fine, you know. But what happened in the hospital was a, a staff nurse in charge called Keith. I wish I knew his second name because I would totally fucking tell you. I would even show you a photograph of him. Um, Keith was in charge and he'd been on all day. Now, I already had a problem with Keith because he was loud he was obnoxious. Sarah had her own room because of the infection risk. He was obnoxious. He was loud. He was bashing into things. He was he was just a fucking shit show. He was a he was a calamity, you know? And at one point he said, Now, for those of you that have no idea, there's level of nurseries in there. Some nurseries can do bedpans, some nurseries can do certain things, some nurseries can do cannulas and putting in the needles into the arms, some of them can't. And he came in and because Sarah was getting so many holes poked in her so fucking often and so many things were happening, her veins were, they were, you know, left to right, left to right all the time. And Keith came in and we had says that the first time, we're going to take this right one out and put a new fresh cannula in the left one because this one's been in too long, the right a date on it, you know. And he's like, I'll need to get one of the higher nurses to do that. And we were like, yep, no problem at all. So then it went away and came back five minutes later with a kit to do the, the, the needle thing. And he's like, I couldn't find anybody. I'll manage it. And at that point, I'm thinking, I've never met Keith before, so maybe I've misheard. I, and normally I'm first to open my mouth, but Sarah's at the back of me going, just behave, you know, it's okay. Don't get too irate about things. And I'm like, okay. So he'd done it. Later we found out that he probably shouldn't have. I don't think he was fully supposed to be doing that. But... There was blood squirting on machines that was left lying by Keith. This fuck it, it was a nightmare. And then he came on the next day, and it, there's a handover on these wards, and they start in this ward in particular, and they start at seven, and they can last about 15, 20 minutes, even half an hour. It's basically a handover. You, I mean, you're no stupid people, you know. Somebody's coming on at seven, uh, been on till seven. Somebody's coming on at seven or half seven. Day shift tells a night shift what's been happening, you know. Sarah buzzed her buzzer. I wasn't there. Sarah buzzed her buzzer. And uh, Keith comes in about 10 to 7, something like that. She says, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. But I think my catheter's shifted and I've there's wee on the bed. I'm so embarrassed. And Keith was like, not a problem. And Sarah was like, all right, cool. So he lifts up her cover a little bit to have a look just to see, you know, what was going on. Turns out that Sarah's stoma had burst or had shifted, whatever it was, right? Now, bear in mind, the thing that, that killed Sarah wasn't the burst bowel, okay? The thing that killed Sarah was the sepsis caused by poo inside her abdomen, okay? That's what happens. And bear in mind, again, the big wound that you've seen in the last video, the vac dressing, which, by the way, is now... Pretty much closed. It's, it's going so well. But at this point, Sarah had poop on her side where the stoma had burst or moved. Burst, I think it had. She had poo on her vagina. She had poo on her legs. And she had poo across that wound, which was covered, but poo across that, that wound. Now, first things first. If that gets back in there, sepsis again. You're not surviving that twice. As I've told you before, 8 out of 10 people die. She didn't. You're not going to survive that. The law is surviving that twice. I, I don't even want to calculate. So she's covered in poo. She's crying. She's mortified. She's embarrassed. And Keith turns to her and says, I'm just about to start a handover. If I start cleaning you now, I'll be late for the handover. I'll be back in a minute or two, right? Sarah straight away, oh, okay, I need a problem because she's so fucking nice. 27 minutes, he left her sitting there covered in shit. 27 minutes. And, uh, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to, 
I'm trying, first of all, I'm trying not to cry because I know how Sarah was when it happened. I'm also trying to tell myself that Keith's no here, so I can't fucking throttle him. But uh, he left her sitting there for half an hour, pretty much, covered in her own shit. Crying, embarrassed, stinking, terrified it was going to go back in. So that was, that was what Keith done. And then there was another person in the hospital that I won't name. Sorry, my customer's going to be here. What time are we? Oh, we're all right. Um, there's another person in the hospital that I won't name in case this gets seen. But they work for a team called SALT, who do spe it's got speech and language therapy. And it's a huge team, so, you know, people won't necessarily know who this person is. But at the same time, I don't really care, and I'm sure this person wouldn't much either. But this person came in to catch up with Sarah. How are you doing? How's things? And um, she's one of, the, one of the staff members where you can talk to her. She treats you like a human being, you know? So, candidly, we had a, we used to chat, Sarah and I, and this person. And Sarah was like, oh, aye, not too bad, I I managed to drink and I managed to eat stuff and it was all great. And then I turned on them and went, oh, aye, everything's great apart from fucking Keith. And then this person went, fucking Keith. And then sort of closed the door a bit, made sure there was nobody there. Fucking Keith. And I thought, you know... Rand sometimes when you'll say certain things to people like for example oh my fucking back's killing me they'll go oh, fucking backs they're just empathizing with you do you know what i mean yeah it turns out that this person wasn't just empathizing with us keith has history one of this person's patients had to report keith because she vomited all down herself and was sat there for an hour covered in her own vomit left by fucking keith now there's been multiple complaints about this guy yet he's still there he's still doing the job or he's still trying to now, we, we brought this up with the, the, the lead nurse in charge and she moved him. I told her that if I seen him, I was going to become the person that I used to be. And uh, she, she she understood what I meant. Now, I, I'm no a bully, I'm no... But there's certain things that bring out the worst in you, you know? And it's things like that. Um, I've done... And I, you know, I'm no... But I've done care. Sarah and I both done care. We looked after kids. We looked after adults shit everywhere we've been there we've done that and if you don't want to deal with it don't do the job okay treat each person like they're your son your mother your daughter your father your and he doesn't do he can't he's a fucking prick but it was all dealt with and he didn't work with her again so that was something but this will all go into the huge complaint when it does happen and the reason i bring it up now obviously is that i can tell you because sarah's said that she's comfortable with me explaining to people now that she has a stoma because it's not, nothing to be ashamed about. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. It saved her life. And the weird thing about it is, prior to this happening, I've told you before, Sarah used to spend pretty much all day, every day in bed, and seething, writhing pain with IBS. If we were, like, we're going to a concert tonight to see my friend's band. And if we were going tonight, which is Friday, um, Sarah would stop eating food probably... Wednesday night stroke Thursday morning because of the risk of the pain and having to run to the toilet and the, the searing pain. The stoma is in her upper bowel. Her irritation must be in her lower bowel. So it's weird, but she has no irritable bowel anymore. She has no pain and she had to die and go through all that to get a huge part of her life back. Yeah, she's got to wear a stoma and she gets embarrassed at by times and whatever, but she's mostly the time she's completely fine. But she has no IBS anymore and it's just the weirdest thing. She's no longer lying in bed in pain. Like I said to part of me, she does have fibromyalgia and she still is in pain. So sometimes she gets exhausted and she has to go for a lie down. Who the fuck doesn't? Who doesn't? You know what I mean? But she no longer spends days in bed. She just doesn't do it. She's downstairs with me. I got my wife back. It's absolutely incredible. So, in a weird way, it's it's just one of the things. And then one of the doctors came in and told us that early, oh no, you can get this reversed in about eight or nine months, maybe a year maximum. In you come, zip, zip, bang, bang, fucking off you go, no stoma anymore. All right, great, brilliant. And then another, another surgeon came in and told us, the risks of reversing stomas are just as much the risk of doing them, sepsis and infection and blah, blah, blah. And we were like, whoa, that's no... You know, that's not what we were sort of told by the other. Oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, she can't choose to get it reversed right now. But when it comes time to get it, to have the choice, she might not. 
that's and that's that's between her and I and mostly her to be fair. I'll support her, but it's just one of the weird things. Which brings me on to part number two of three. Um because they move around your intestines and your bowels inside and stuff when you get this operation, it before it can bef it can develop weakness. And as a result, which is really common, almost I think it was 88% of people get one, but they can get a hernia right at the site of the stoma because the muscles there are so soft and they're not used to being there and the, the intestines and the bowel and stuff that there's space there. And um, Sarah keeps on saying it's because I make her laugh so much that she's developed a hernia, which is fine, I'll take that. But uh, it's coughing, it can be anything, but she has got a hernia there. So we're waiting to hear back about that. Doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. There's people coming to the house to measure her for a hernia belt, which if I'm led, if I'm reading right, can help sort of gently press the hernia back in. And So that's something, which is a bit of a bummer. But... Um, I'll need to finish part three because my customer's here, so uh, bear with me, all right? Part three is uh, something else. So I'll be back with you in maybe, well, for um, for me, it'll be an hour or two. For you, it will be right now. So, an hour later. Um, part number three, and um, we were just talking about this last night, and it's Sarah came to me, she says, you can tell people now. And I'm like, you sure? She's like, yep. As I said to you before, when I was in hospital, uh, when Sarah was in hospital, and various other things and stress and whatnot. I was my hair was I was thinning, you know, I was just getting thin hair. Um so I got a haircut. Um and I think I mentioned it to people before, but Sarah had wounds on the back of her, her head. Um as a result of the operation and the trauma and and immune deficiency and stuff, Sarah started losing hair, which I mentioned to you before in an an earlier video. But it's and it stopped coming out for a while. Um, she just had a sort of patch on the back. And uh, I'll show you pictures. She, she's asked me to, to make people aware because this is another part of the journey that some people might not be aware of. And it can be quite common, I think. Um, but the wounds on her head, they weren't really looked at quick enough, if I'm honest with you. And we still haven't had a follow-up from a dermatologist. She's been home quite a while and service is kind of poor. But we'll deal with that another time. Um, so yes, as a result, it stopped falling out for a bit, but it restarted to fall, restarted? Yeah, started to fall out again, and it's fallen out quite a lot, so she's losing her hair. The bits that were already gone have started to grow back in again, so um, she's almost got a long, shaved, sort of... Um, Chelsea girl haircut, if you like, which is probably what she's going to end up doing. But she wanted me to make people aware that this is just another part of her journey and she's probably going to lose her hair. Which is a big deal because Sarah was uh, was sort of somewhat known for her hair. Not somewhat, she was. Her hair was so thick. And she used to dye it herself and cut it herself and she was very talented. And she'll be watching this now crying, I bet you. And But it's it's coming out it's falling out it's just unfortunate uh, it's a lot more than unfortunate but it's uh, it's unfortunate that it's happened started again and it's just a deficiency uh, an immune immune deficiency thing um and we're not quite sure why because she's eating pr plenty of protein she's getting her energy back and stuff i just don't i don't i don't know why but it is what it is it's happening so she's her her thinking is and i, I agree with her um, if she does get the hair shaved and, and a, a Chelsea girl haircut or whatever she does, she then won't have to worry about seeing handfuls that coming out all the time, you know, because it, it breaks her heart every time it happens. And she tries to be stoic and tries to be strong, and then she is. She's the strongest person I know, but sometimes it just beats. It just, you, you can't pretend to be strong all the time, you know. As I've said this before, the, the face of depression is now a big smile, you know, and you just can't let... You can't you can't hide it sometimes. So if she does get it cut, then she'll not have to worry about it falling out, you know. But so yeah, I'm going to show you some pictures of her hair now. Uh, this was all her request, um, and she what she just wants people to understand that getting through the operation stuff and living's great, but it, that's not where when you leave the hospital. Well, that's not where the the road ends. In some aspects, it just starts there really. So. Yeah, so I'll show you now what her, what her head looks like. And 
the big one that's still red, that was really bad. That was quite raw. I had to put cream on it every day for her. Once we finally got the cream, um, we waited six, eight weeks for that cream and we should have had it for day three or four and it was a bit of a fucking shit show. But that one just seems to not be healing as well. Um, there's not a huge warning needed like the last video with the wound and stuff. It doesn't look like that. But you'll see you'll see what I mean. So don't be too alarmed. It's not going to be an open wound or nothing. Um, and the other one that was, was, was quite bad, that one healed first. And the, the, the Sarah was reading that no hair grows back on them. That's like permanent. But as you'll see, there's some hair growing back on the, the first one. So it just needs, I think, a longer time to heal. Like the second one's still red. Um, but you'll see what I mean in a second. So check this out. What Sarah's working with. That's what she's been working with. That's what she's been trying to hide. What she has been hiding. Um, and there's no shame in it. But shame and embarrassment are two different things, aren't they? So uh, I feel no shame. <laughs> I very rarely feel shame. I very, very rarely feel, rarely feel embarrassed about anything either. So that's maybe a bad example. But there's no shame at all in what Sarah's feeling. But I can understand embarrassment. And I'm sure you all can as well. Especially, and I don't want to be sexist, and if people think I am, then fuck it, whatever. But especially for a woman, men's men's looks are just as important to them, I guess. But in my head, and it's just the way that I feel, and I don't really care what other people think, women's hair are more important to them than men's hair. And to lose it, it's just, it fucking sucks. And then at the risk of sounding selfish, to watch your wife brush her hair and have a handful come out and then cry every other day and... It's just fucking, you know, I just feel powerless. I just feel shit. And, but that's a selfish thing, I suppose, for me. But again, I'm going to go into our feelings and how we're emotionally and mentally dealing with everything in another video. But for now, that's the three things that, that was the update. All right. So, uh, yes, subscribe to the channel because there's more coming. If any of this is helping anybody, then great. Uh, if not, then hopefully it never has to. If you understand what I mean, hopefully you never have to look back on this for advice. But if you do, then I hope it helps one person. Uh, hi, subscribe to the channel, watch the videos, let people know, share them, because it might help someone that you know. Uh, but that's it. So thank you very much for watching. And to my wife, I love you more than life itself. All right? And I'll see you soon. Take it easy. Bye.